It's Thanksgiving, and there are many things to be thankful for in life, but even if there were only two, they would be the two supreme things. To live is Christ, to die is gain. To be alive in the Lord Jesus Christ is cause for great thanksgiving, and even greater cause for thanksgiving is to know that what lies beyond this life is something even better. And so let's listen to what the Apostle Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in Philippians 1, verses 20 through 26. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain with you. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. This ends the reading of God's Word, and God always blesses His Word to those who listen. To live is Christ, to die is gain. You could summarize the whole book of Philippians with those two statements, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You could summarize what it means to be a Christian, the entirety of the Christian life, with those two statements, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you have your roots deep in those two realities, then nothing can shake you. You'll be like the apostle. You say, I, I'm confident that I'm going to have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted, whether by my life or by my death. Those are the two options. I'm either alive in Christ or I'm dead and have departed this world and gone to be with Christ. And either way, it's wonderful. In fact, I'd be better off dead. Now, if you hear somebody say, well, I, I'd be better off dead... Most of the time you say, boy, they must be miserable. Someone who would rather die than continue in this life. But for the Apostle Paul, he saw this life as something that's bursting with joy. Later on, he says um, to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. This is the guy who sang in the Philippian jail. Rejoicing always because he knew that his life was fruitful labor. He knew that Christ was his life, and he loved being alive. And even, so, even then, he said, but to die is gain. Then I'll be closer to Christ than I've ever been, and that is a huge gain. If we don't have that kind of courage and that kind of joy, then it's probable that we still have a lot of growing to do in understanding and embracing the reality of these two statements. If for me is not Christ, if my life is not all wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ, then I'm not going to have the joy and contentment and courage that the Apostle wrote about. And if I'm not so sure that death is gain, if I dread leaving this life, if I can't imagine that there's something better beyond this, if what I'm looking forward to is, boy, I hope that I can walk uh, my daughter down the aisle. I hope that I can see my grandchildren. I hope that this and I hope that that. Th those are all things that, that naturally we might want in this life. I hope that I'll be healthy to a good old age. Uh, we can be hoping for things in this life, but not looking forward to what lies beyond it. Then we're going to be chronically scared of dying. We're going to spend most of our living running scared. If you're not ready to die, you're not really ready to live. And so we need to hear what God is saying to us, the, the reality of living as Christ and, 
dying as gain. To live is Christ. What did that mean for the apostle? Well, you can summarize so much of Philippians in that statement. To live is Christ means that I live by his life in me. He's the one who makes me alive in him. And when I live and when I act, I'm living by his life and I'm acting by his action. Right at the very beginning of Philippians, the apostle says that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ. That's a mighty fine verse to know when you've just made profession of faith. He who started a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day Jesus comes again. That God is at work in us and he's going to complete what he started. A little later the apostle says, Now work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act for his good purposes. It's not just you trying to do what pleases God. It's God working in you that gives you that desire and the strength to do that in the first place. And then near the very end of Philippians, the apostle says, My God will meet all of your needs according to his riches, his, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So that's what it means to have Christ's life in you and to live by his life and to act by his action. He's going to complete what he began. He's at work in you to will and to act, to want and to do things. And he's the one who's going to supply everything you need for that out of the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To live as Christ. If you're depending on your own resources, you're not going to be able to do that. But when Christ is in you, living and working in you, then you can. And also, when Christ is in you and when for you to live as Christ, it means that you have the very mind of Jesus and his thoughts are thinking their way into your thoughts. It's true that we have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, says so in so many words. In another letter, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. And in Romans, he says, the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. But in this letter, he says, now, given the fact that we have the mind of Christ, now have the mind of Christ. He says in Philippians chapter 2, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by having the same mind being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind in you. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now have that mind. You've already got Christ in you, now have that mind. Let that mind dominate whatever other thoughts are going through your mind so that you're considering others, um, you're prioritizing them above yourself. You're giving yourself for them just the way Jesus has given himself for us. And it's not just then having Jesus as your example, although he is, but it's actually having Jesus and his mind thinking and his attitude shaping your attitude because he's in you. And then shine with his light. The apostle says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you'll be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation as you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. You're shining with his light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He also said, you are the light of the world. And how is that? Well, because he's in you. And when he's in you, you more and more shine. And instead of being a griper and a grumbler and a complainer, you instead are shining with the light of contentment 
and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. So live his life, act by his action, think his thoughts, shine his light because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And to live as Christ is also um, to be thinking of others and, and committing your life to serving them. What, what did the Apostle Paul, before he said um, to die is gain, he said, well, to live is Christ. And what did that involve? Well, he says, you know, I expect and hope um, that I won't be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that Christ is going to be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And then he says, now I'm not sure which I choose. I know that it'd be way better to go and be with Christ but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And why is it so important that he remain in the body? Well, he says, so that I can help your progress in the faith and your joy in the faith, and so that your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow because uh, I'm still here and I'm blessing you. There's only one reason why you're here on the planet. Well, there's another possible one. But to depart and be with Christ is far better. So the reason you're here is so that you can bring joy to others and bring blessing to others and help them in their progress in the faith and help them in their growth. Otherwise, you're just taking up air. Okay? That's why he leaves us here, is so because to live is Christ. There is one other reason why he might leave us here a while, and that is because we're not ready. We're not ready to say dying is gain. We're not ready to be with him in eternity because we're still not with him here in this life. But if we do have Christ and he has us, then to live is Christ. And the whole point of it is not that you're looking out for your own pleasure, your own enjoyment, your own selfish gain, because you would have more gain if you just went to be with Christ, if he just took you right now out of this world. He's leaving you here because, as the Apostle said, it's more necessary for you that I remain. Um, and if God says that's why you're here, then you're here. If you have children, you're here to bless them. If you have parents, you're here to bless them. If there are people in your circle of friends, look at the ways you can bless them. If there are enemies, look at the way you can pray for them and bless them. But God's purpose is so that you can help people to come to know Jesus, to progress in their faith, and to have joy. You get joy from bringing joy to others. And then in all of that, the apostle says that I want to know Christ better and better. To live is Christ, so even if it's not time for me to come out of this world, my time in this life is to get to know him better and better and better. He says, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. He says this in chapter 3, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So He is the one who knows that it is not his goodness that makes him right in God's sight. It is the goodness of Jesus credited to him, the righteousness that's from God and is by faith. But he doesn't stop there. Christ has come into his life. He has been drawn into Christ's life. And it is a wonderful truth of the gospel that our standing with God depends completely on what Jesus has already done. That when God takes our sins and nails them to the cross of Jesus, and takes Jesus' goodness and credits all of his righteousness to us, then we are completely right with God forever. And we don't keep checking our bank account to see whether we have enough. We have more than enough because Christ has been credited to us. And yet, you don't say, boy, I am sure glad I have a fabulous fire insurance policy. I have Jesus, and his perfection is credited to me, and I'm not going to hell. Woohoo! And now, back to business as usual. No. Uh, that's not how it works. You receive Christ's justifying righteousness if you're united to him. Without Christ, you're not justified by faith either, uh, because you don't have him. But once you have Christ by faith, then the rest of your life is gaining more 
and more of Christ. What does the apostle say right after? He says, I have a righteousness that's not my own by the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Then he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And then he says, not that I've already attained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on toward the goal, toward the heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. So to live as Christ is to say, I know Christ some, and not nearly as well as I would like to. And so he leaves me on this earth partly to bring blessing to others, but partly so that I can be growing every day in my knowledge of him, becoming more and more like Jesus in the things I suffer and go through, so that I can be more and more like Jesus in the life he brings and in the resurrection power that he brings. And when you live a life like that, then you have all of these blessings. When you have Christ, you have all. The apostle prays for the Philippians, and he says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. He wants them to grow. When you're growing in Jesus, you're growing in love. When you're growing in Jesus, you're growing in knowledge, in the ability to know what's best and to be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. That's his prayer for them. He says he wants them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So this love, this knowledge, this insight, this purity, you move towards the end of the letter and he says rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't just say be happy all the time and, and you know, get a more positive attitude. He says rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in Him always. Whatever else is going wrong, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by praise and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what happens? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, knowing where you stand with him, the courage of the Lord saying, hey, I, I know that um, now as always, I'm going to have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And then contentment, being satisfied. The apostle says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances, whether in plenty or in need. He says, I know what it is to be in plenty. I know what it is to be in need. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That little snippet is very popular. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, and it deserves to be popular. The context is I can be content no matter what happens. If I lose the game, um, I can lose graciously. If I go through a hard time, I can shed some tears, and yet I can still be content in Christ. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. It does not guarantee that tomorrow is going to be easy, or that everything is going to go the way you hoped. The apostle says, I know what it's like to have plenty. And let's face it, sometimes you need special grace from God to stay close to Jesus when you have plenty. When everything's going your way, it's sometimes very hard to keep focused on the Lord because you get focused on all that other stuff that, that you get so wrapped up in. And we can be thankful when we have plenty if we recognize and thank God as the source of it all. But he also knows what it is to be in want and still to be content because he has Christ. That's the key to life. To, to live is Christ. And so... Just urge each of you to consider again, is it, is it your goal, which the apostle had, I want to know Christ. I want to know that power of his resurrection already working in me right now. And when I go through sufferings, I want to be the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. 
And I want to be like Christ in bringing light and joy to others. And if he's using me in that way, if it's fruitful labor, then I'm going to be content. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Don't just take up oxygen. Don't just eat food and exist and have some pleasant sensations and maybe some not so pleasant sensations and then check out of this life of fruitful labor, bringing joy and progress to others, to live as Christ. And it's hard to have that attitude unless you know the second part of it as well, to die is gain, that Jesus has got me, that I can glorify him in my body whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead. Either way, I want what's going to glorify him the most. If him leaving me in this life and on this planet and in this body is what's going to advance his cause and bring him the most glory, then so be it. If him taking me out of this life is what is going to most glorify him and the way that I face my death, then so be it. But either way, to live is Christ, to die is gain, and I want Christ to be glorified in my body, whether by life or by death. When we think about what comes after death and leaving this life, there's a lot of fake news going around. And so it's important that we consider some different headlines of the fake news about departed souls. One is the idea of soul sleep. The idea that when a Christian dies, they are no longer conscious or aware of anything. They are just sleeping. And then when Jesus comes again and at his resurrection, then they will wake up in their new and glorious body. But in between the time of their death and the time of Jesus' return, they are literally out of it. They just are sleeping. Well, the Bible does speak of death as falling asleep, but it's using that because it's like your body falling asleep. But that does not mean that you're no longer conscious of anything in your soul. The Bible says that to depart and be with Christ is better by far. To be with Christ, to be aware of Him, to be in His presence, we'll see a bit more about that. But it is false to say that you're just out of it and not aware of anything between the time of your death and the time of being raised to new life when Jesus comes again. There is a view of soul sleep among some people, but it's fake news. Another piece of fake news is, well, their spirit is still with us. No, it's not. No, it's not. It may um, comfort some to think that your departed loved one is still hovering about nearby somewhere, but they have departed. To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord, not hanging out with your best buds back on earth. The spirit departs. And so you sometimes see movies where, um, you know, the spirit of someone who's died comes back and communicates and says things that they should have said while they were still alive but didn't, didn't. But now they got another chance. And they're back as a ghost or on a field of dreams or, you know, in some other setting where, well, shucks, you know, we didn't, get a, we didn't have a, the right relationship in life, but now we can make up for it with the ghost returning. No, you can't. If you want to love somebody and tell them that you love them, you say it now. You don't count on a return trip from the beyond in order to say something or do something. This means if you have unfinished business, now is the time to live for Christ. Now is the time to say what needs saying and do what needs doing because your spirit will not be with others after you depart. They may have memories of you, if good things you did for them and kind words you said to them, those things will live on in their memories, but your spirit won't. The Apostle Paul knew that if he was to be of help, he had to do it now. We can thank God that he got stuck in jail quite a few times. Because otherwise he'd have been so busy uh, you know, planting churches and this and that that we wouldn't have uh, nearly as much of the New Testament. He wrote Philippians from a Roman jail. Pilgrim's Progress got written by... John Bunyan from a jail. You know, some of the greatest writings in the world have been written from jail, but 
they wrote them, and those writings are still with us. The spirit of the departed is gone. But if you do things in this life, uh, that's your only chance. So evaluate what, what's the point. What are you doing in this life? And then make the most of it. And if there is somebody you love who's departed, don't try to communicate with the spirits of the dead. There are some who become so desperate that they want to hear from somebody who's on the other side. The Bible very strongly warns against trying to communicate with the spirits of the dead. And so we don't pray to dead saints. We don't ask for insights from dead loved ones. We don't ask for them to pay us a visit. We are going to have to rely on the comfort of God, on the comfort of Jesus when we've lost somebody, because they are gone. Not forever. We'll be reunited, but the separation is there, and we don't have opportunity to make up for it once they're gone. So, again, in light of that, the fact that I could be gone tomorrow, the fact that you could be gone tomorrow, the fact that I won't have a chance to do more to show love to somebody once I'm taken out of this world, the fact that they won't be there to receive it if God takes them out of this world, means that we've got to make our lives count right now in the relationships that we have. Another piece of fake news, heaven gained another angel. No, it didn't. God made a bunch of angels, made a lot of archangels, made the cherubim, the seraphim, the different ranks and, and levels of authorities and powers. He made many angels, and you ain't one of them, and you never will be. Okay? You're, you're not. Heaven does not gain another angel. Heaven gains a human soul when a person who follows Jesus Christ goes to be with him in glory. And when we go to be with Christ, and then later when our bodies are raised, we don't become an angel. We become exalted above angels. Because Christ became a human. He didn't become an angel. And the Bible says, don't you know that you will rule the world? Don't you know that you will judge angels? So, we don't become an angel. We get, you know, we make a very big jump in the promotion, okay? From being lower than the angels, sometimes by quite a bit to being exalted to an authority where we sit with Christ on his throne. But we don't go become an angel. You remain human. There is one verse in the Bible where Jesus said that they won't marry or be given in marriage, but they'll be like the angels. They'll be like the angels in the sense that in heaven, you won't have family life and marriage in quite the same way that you did um, during this life. But instead... You will be like the angels in that respect, that no longer will it be the family ties that are the closest for you. You'll still know and love family members, but that family will be so broadened, and the institution of marriage itself will give way to something much better. We don't know what that much better is or looks like, but we do know that we're going to be like the angels only in that one respect. Jesus was talking about what happens with marriage, not about us becoming an angel, when he said you're going to be like the angels. You're going to be like the angels in that respect. But you don't become Michael or Gabriel or some other great archangel. You, you're still you. You're still you. Only the wonderful, exalted you in Christ that God meant you to be. And maybe the worst fake news is when we say of somebody who has departed, yeah, they deserve to go to heaven. What? You know, that... that kind of statement is just an obvious uh, a statement that just comes from false teaching. That heaven is based on what you've earned, what you've deserved, and if the balance on the scale shows, hey, the good outweighed the bad, then heaven it is. If not, well, then hell it is, although nobody thinks their own balance um, would be that bad. But the Bible teaches that without Christ, hell is the only other option. We go to heaven based on Christ, not on what we deserve. Don't ask for what you deserve when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. Ask for what he deserves and for what he gives you. So, fake news. Um, no soul sleep. None of this, their spirit is still with us. None of this notion that, oh, now they got changed into an angel or something. No. Um, and certainly not that they deserve to get there. Jesus is the only way. To die is gain. What happens when you die? Well, the apostle says in this passage simply, to depart and be with Christ is better by far. To be with Christ is, is the core and the main joy of it. 
But what happens? Well, when you die, your body is like it's sleeping. It, it is totally unconscious. It lies there. Um, it is without breath, without heartbeat, and soon decays. Your body is gone for the time being, but your soul is wide awake. And what happens to that soul? When you belong to Jesus, the scripture says that the angels escort the soul of the blessed to the realm of the blessed. So when you die, you know, you may have been unconscious when it happened, or you may, the last thing you may have seen was some doctors or some car flying at you or whatever. But the next thing that you see are the angels of God. The next thing you see are the angels of God. And they take your soul, they take your spirit, and they give you an angel escort. Angels are ministering servants that God sends for his people, and that is one of their great ministries, is to bring the spirit or soul of the blessed into the presence of Jesus, to paradise, without delay. You remember what Jesus said to that criminal who was crucified next to him, who pleaded for his forgiveness and said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom? Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, today you will be um, sleeping and sinking into soul sleep until a far off time. He didn't say, today you'll be in purgatory and maybe someday you'll get out and be in paradise. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's his promise. And that's what the apostle is echoing. He says, to depart and be with Christ. As soon as he departs, He's going to be with Christ, and that's better by far. To be at home with Jesus. To be at home with the one who bled and died for your salvation. To be at home with the one who made all the worlds and designed everything about you. Who knew all the days ordained for you and had them in his book before even one of them came to be. You're at home with him. And you can enjoy him. If your life's desire has been to know Christ better and better, then at last you're going to be there in his presence, enjoying him in perfect Holiness and joy forever and ever. No more are you going to have a, a soul that's cold 80% of the time. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just feel so far from Christ. I hope you don't know what I'm talking about, but I know what I'm talking about. Okay? Where so often you feel distant. So often you feel like you are very lukewarm. So often things can even feel unreal to you. And that's part of walking through this life by faith. But there we don't walk by faith. We walk by sight. Because then we're in his very presence. And when you're there, of course, you'll, you'll also be there with the spirits of those who have departed. The Bible says that when we come to the heavenly Jerusalem, we've come to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Righteous people made perfect. Their spirits are there too. And so we can enjoy the, the company of the saints and angels, of those who've gone before us of parents who've gone before us, of children who've gone before us, of friends, of people whom we didn't even know in earlier um, eras of church history, those missionaries who first carried the gospel to the lands that eventually um, brought it to us, uh, those heroes of faith that we didn't even know about, we'll get to know them and to rejoice in them that they're there and we're there. And we can rejoice in the presence of the angels and they will be rejoicing over us the Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels whenever one sinner on earth repents. What do you think the joy is when they actually get to the gates of glory and their soul enters in to be with Christ? There will be joy among the angels, joy in the presence of the angels, the joy above all, not just of the reunion with the angels or of the people, but of Jesus himself. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I'm not making these things up. I'm just quoting. Okay? These are the things that God says in his holy word. And so there are going to be joys there beyond earthly words. The Apostle Paul had a bit of an advantage on us, I think. Um, I won't call it an unfair advantage because he had to go through a lot. But he said that God took him to heaven. And he didn't know whether it was in the body or just his spirit going to heaven. And that was even before he died. And he saw things there that were inexpressible, that can't be put into words. And what about Lazarus, the man who died? And then Jesus brought him back to life. I'm sure his sisters were glad to see him back. I'm not so sure Lazarus was glad to be back. But he, we don't have any information from Lazarus 
about what he did or didn't experience there because there are things there that no one can tell. There are joys beyond earthly words. But the Apostle Paul did say that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's about the only report we get back from the guy who had been to heaven and back is that all these sufferings, you know, the five beatings with rods and um, the three beatings with rods, the five times, the 39 lashes, the three shipwrecks, the, the imprisonments, the, the execution, it's not worth comparing to the glory. So he just said to die is gain. And so we can be confident that if we're absent from the body, we're at home with the Lord, and it is better to be that way, and we need to take God's word for it. And that's not the final state. This is actually talking about what the theologians call the intermediate state between death and, re and resurrection. After resurrection, then our bodies are returned to us in a glorified form, and the new creation heaven comes to earth. And all things on earth are made as God intended them to be. So there's basically four stages that a person can go through. One is an awful stage that even now some people are stuck in. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. I'll tell you again, as I've often told you, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their stomach. Their destiny is destruction their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. That is the perfect summary of life without Christ. The gut is God. Your appetites and desires and wants are what reign over you. They are what mean everything for you. And your destiny is destruction. You're on that road to hell. Your mind is entirely on earthly things. And it might not even be all bad earthly things. It's just you're caught up in what you can see around you, never in the life of Christ or what is beyond you. When Christ redeems you from that, then you're brought into the stage when you're alive and to live is Christ and it's fruitful labor and it's peace and joy in the Lord. It is knowing the love that surpasses knowledge, the peace that surpasses understanding, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. God gives us the Holy Spirit and so we get a down payment, a foretaste, of the joys of heaven. There are some people who have had uh, an experience or a taste of God so powerful that it changes their whole life. And in a sense, some of them are called mystics. Others, uh, you know, are Christians that have just had amazing encounters with God. And it happens in this life that they get a down payment, a seal on themselves, an assurance from the Holy Spirit. And every believer receives the Holy Spirit where he teaches us to call Abba, Father. And so, to live is Christ, and then the next stage, to die is gain. And that's what we might call the present heaven, or the intermediate state, where the soul goes to be with Jesus. And part of that is hard to imagine, maybe even partly hard to get excited about. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, I don't want to be found naked. By that he meant, I don't want to be without a body. I was meant to have a soul in a body. I, don't, I can't imagine what it's like to be without a body. But then he goes on to say, but uh, I know that being with Christ is still going to be better, even if I'm there for a while without a body. I'm still at least there as a soul or spirit in his presence. But that's not the final stage. The final stage is when Jesus comes again and brings heaven to earth, and the earth is made new, and the earth becomes God's dwelling place, which is to say it becomes heaven. And the whole creation, the animal creation, God's people are all raised glorious. That's our final destiny, is to have glorious resurrection bodies, not just to be spirits in Jesus' presence, but to be embodied people on earth where heaven has come to earth and the meek inherit the earth. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Almost an exact parallel in that passage to the passage we're considering in Philippians 1. Away from the body, at home with the Lord, and confidence because of that. And so in the meantime, what do we do? We make it our goal to please him, whether at home in the body or away from it. That's the goal. He said, um, 
Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we belong to the Lord. There's only two situations um, in which Jesus has to be everything. When you're alive and when you're dead. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we pray that so much more of your life will flood ours. That we may know you, Lord Jesus, better and better. And in knowing you better, become more like you. And in becoming more like you, bringing blessing and joy and courage and wisdom and truth to others. And Lord, prepare us more and more for that day when we see you face to face. So that we won't be meeting a stranger. So that we won't meet someone whom we hardly know. But rather, our blessed friend and brother and Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, may our life be Christ and may our dying be gain. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort our hearts um, in the loss of loved ones who have gone to be with you with these words. We pray that you will strengthen our hearts to live for you in the time that you still give us. And in all of it, Lord, may you be exalted, whether by our life or by our death. For Jesus' sake, amen.